will be about the Palestinian issue, the cause of Palestine, Palestinian liberation, etc. So like, why did he choose it? Like it's, it's always the Palestinian issue should always be at the forefront of everybody's minds who is uh, an anti-imperialist because at present, but at present, or at least like for more than a hundred years, I should say, Palestinians have been facing the most violent form of colonialism, which is a settler colonialism from an apartheid state that was forcibly placed into the heart of the Middle East, where it should not have existed. And this settler colonialism is now ethnically and culturally cleansing Palestine, killing people every day. And at the same time, it has its big worldwide media apparatus and through it it uh, like demonizes the Palestinian people. So it is in order to counter all these sort of narratives that uh, we try at the Orinoco Tribune and it is like this talk is a part of that uh, effort that we make here. So and also as a Venezuela based outlet it's important for us because Israel the apartheid state does not not only has its destructive effects in the Middle East or in Asia and Africa in general, but also as far as the South American continent on the other side of the world, uh, not only through its media, which it uses to brainwash and demonize uh, people, but also it uh, exports its repressive tactics to places like Colombia, where it has trained the police and the military in a country that was already violent and facing a civil war. So it's in this situation that we are doing today's uh, event. And today we have with us a very special guest. He is Khaled Barakat, a Palestinian Canadian journalist and activist who has himself faced his uh, fair share of uh, confrontation and smear campaigns from the Israeli lobby. Very recently, he was the subject of a smear campaign from the Canadian conservative news outlet, National Post, and, uh, which called him a terrorist. And at the same time, uh, like this thing went on to the Canadian Senate, where a parliamentarian said that Barakat should be expelled, should be deported, although he is a Canadian citizen. And this is not the first time that he is facing this uh, issue, is facing this because uh, uh, in 2019, he was in a similar situation in Germany where the police prevented him from uh, speaking at an event in Berlin, and then he was deported from there. So welcome Khaled, thanks a lot for accepting this invitation. And today, today's panel will also be shared by an Orinoco Tribune editor, Jesus Rodriguez Espinosa, and, uh, and our team member, Dana Nidal, who is herself Palestinian. So welcome and let's start. So we'll start with the issue that has been facing us for a long time and which I have been mentioning all this time is that how to confront this international Zionist lobby and its media that demonizes Palestine as well as everyone who is in solidarity with the Palestinian cause. And what sort of support can the international solidarity movement provide to the Palestinian cause to Palestines and how should that support look like? Uh, I will start with Khaled because like you are the, I think you are the best person to answer this question. Thank you so much, uh, Sahili, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm the best one to answer this question, but I will try to uh, contribute uh, maybe some ideas uh, uh, on this topic, because uh, this is really what the conflict is about. When we say that there is a smear campaigns and Zionist attacks against Palestinians and their supporters, we're talking about the conflict itself, that there is a political conflict happening and the Zionist movement and their allies use everything in their arsenal in order to do uh, three things. One is to divert the discussion from uh, the real issues, which is settler colonialism, as uh, Sahili mentioned, 
and about you know the Israeli atrocities and crimes committed against the Palestinian people. They want to also divert the attention from other forces who are complicit in this in these crimes, because it's not just Israel who's committing these crimes against the Palestinian people since 1948. But there are imperialist powers who are backing Israel and maintaining their support to Israel in order to carry on this, uh, these attacks. And of course, for example, the British role in distorting the uh, discussion in supporting Israel because they are the one who is responsible on actually creating the state of uh, Israel in 1948 by providing all the support they did since 1917 until 1948, supporting Zionist organizations. Uh, and the same goes on other imperialist power like France, like the United States, Germany, and other. So they, they are complicit with the Zionist discourse because they are the colonialist powers who dominated the region after the World War I. The other forces who are also complicit and doing nothing about these Zionist attacks and smears are the Arab subcontractors and Arab reactionary regimes who are also declaring their alliance these days also with Israel, but who all the time were involved in presenting the Palestinian case in uh, uh, not uh, in in a, uh, the way that Palestinian wants to present their case, and so there is a distortion, and there is a, a diversion from the real issues. Also, when they call Palestinian resistant terrorism, and that is the main argument they use, uh, that is because they want to say that Palestinian people have no cause and have no rights. The minute you call someone terrorist, you strip them from their cause and from their rights. So Palestinians, they want to present us as just people who likes to fight Israel. We have nothing else to do in our life but to fight Israel. And so we are used to this Zionist discourse, but these days, especially in the last 20 years, uh, with Palestinians rising again, the Palestinian role in the diaspora, in the Shetat, is also growing. The Palestinian resistance is accumulating power, and part of that power is media and confronting Zionist media and, and distortions and smear campaigns. And the commitment of the Palestinian people to the struggle in order to uh, clarify why Palestinians are fighting and they fight for what? You know, at one point of our struggle, Palestinians had to take some extreme measures in order to address their case. One of these extreme measures, for example, is hijacking airplanes. Now, this is something that you always hear in the media, that Palestinians have hijacked airplanes in the past, and uh, these are terrorist organizations who have done this. You can see Hollywood movies, hundreds of Hollywood movies about, you know, hijacking airplanes. But they will not tell you, for example, that not one single person was killed in these hijacking of airplanes. They want to hide these, you know, facts because they don't want to tell you that the real the reason between the real aim and objectives of Palestinian resistance was to actually address the questions of who are the Palestinians and why they are fighting and for what. The, these are extreme measures and tactical measures that Palestinians had to take at one point of their uh, life. These days, for example, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of one of our cultural and political icon, Ghassan Kenafani, 50 years ago, they assassinated him with his niece, Lamis Najm. Ghassan Kenafani never carried a gun. He was an intellectual, a revolutionary intellectual. The reason they killed Ghassan Kenafani is because of his, uh, and many other intellectuals, Palestinian intellectuals, is because of their role 
in confronting Zionist smear campaigns and Zionist uh, propaganda and media. And so this is a continuation of something that we have been living for a very long time. Now, how to fight this? I think that I would like to hear others and uh, uh, different opinions and, and ideas, but I think the way to uh, confront Zionist propaganda is one, provide the public and the people with facts on the ground. Facts that is not disputable, facts that they are empirical and no one can argue with that. You know, the colonizers in places like Canada, New Zealand, the United States and other places have massacred the indigenous native people in these uh, uh, continents 500 years ago. There were no cameras to record that. There were no documents to show that. But in the Palestinian case, this happened in 1948. So Palestinians have all the documents of their case, and it's a just case. People could see exactly what happened in 1948. So we have to provide people with facts. The other thing is we have to understand that the Palestinian cause is not just a conflict between Palestinians and Israel. Because if we limit this conflict to just between Palestinians and Israel, it is not going to be uh, you know, the full picture. The full picture is when we expose the imperialist and colonizer powers who are involved in this uh, conflict and the right-wing fascist locally. There are supporters of Israel in Venezuela there are supporters of Israel in Bolivia. There are supporters of Israel everywhere. And the reason they support Israel, these right-wing fascist, you know, racist uh, trends, is because they're fighting locally against socialists and against the people uh, in general and against, you know, they want to blunder the resources of the people. So, of course, they will be with Israel. So our comrades around the world and our alliance around the world are also involved in the struggle to expose the Zionist propaganda and not just us. So it is a fight where uh, common fronts and common grounds are there uh, because of the nature of the conflict and the nature of the uh, uh, Palestinian uh, situation. Uh, thanks a lot, Khalid, for that comprehensive breakdown. It was very good. And of course, like you mentioned, it's a, it should be a worldwide cause. And uh, everywhere who is against imperialism should be with Palestine. So I would now come to Jesus, who has experiences in both the North and the South of the continent of America. So Jesus, please uh, talk about your experiences in Palestinian solidarity movement in this region, as well as what Khaled mentioned, the uh, anti-Palestinians in countries, not just, he mentioned Venezuela and Bolivia, but it's uh, much more stronger in countries like Argentina and Chile, where uh, like Chile is the country with outside of the Middle East, it hosts the largest Palestinian diasporic population in the world. And yet in Chile, there is a very anti -Palestinian, strong anti-Palestinian sentiment. I mean, as well as in Argentina, as well as uh, very similar to in the US or Canada. So please talk about your experiences. Yes, thank you, Sahili. Uh, uh... Thank you, Khaled, for joining us today, and thank you, Dana and Sahili, for uh, giving shape to this uh, conversation today. Uh, I, I, I'm not an expert in Palestinian issues, but I, uh, through the time, especially for the last, I don't know, 20 years, I've been learning a lot and understanding better how uh, complex and how uh, uh, rightful is the Palestinian people to demand what is theirs. So, so in that sense, I just want to share, share a few things that I believe are important in this particular topic that we are discussing at this moment of, the, of our talk, which is basically my experience with Zionism. I mean, as a diplomat, uh, uh, 
of Venezuela in the US, we had to deal with the Zionist lobby. Uh, I don't know if you remember that uh, at some point Chavez, Hugo Chavez was heavily attacked by Zionists uh, all over the world uh, because he stand in defending the Palestinian cause and in, in, in denouncing the atrocities of the apartheid regime. Uh, and, uh, and because of that, and in my roles as, as, as diplomat, uh, I had to face uh, uh, letters coming from, from the U.S. Federation or from the AJC, the anti-U.S. committee, or, I mean, those are the lobbies. I mean, those are the big lobbies, the big Zionist lobbies operating forces, operating at least the ones that I know in the U.S. There are others, of course, but uh, uh, at least those are the ones that we had to face and, and we had meetings with them. And, and we tried to let them know that, 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 that there was nothing uh, anti-Semitic in Hugo Chavez's speeches, because that's one of the, the things that they use uh, the most. I mean, uh, mixing uh, religion with uh, politics. Uh, uh, and, 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 and that's a strategy that I feel that has been, uh, been diminished, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel that uh, that strategy has been getting, uh, losing uh, traction in recent years. May, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but I believe that the Palestinians has been able to, to neutralize that uh, tricky play that the Zionist lobby uh, uh, did for years and still do does, but... Uh, um, but uh, but they did it very strong uh, for decades, and 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 is the is the, is this tricking which they tell you that if you criticize uh, the Israeli upper high upper height, uh, regime and atrocities, you are an anti-Semitic, which at some point I understood uh, is something. Uh, uh, taken out of the blue, so, so something taken out of context, uh, because being uh, doing that, criticizing those atrocities, uh, uh, at least the way I see it, uh, means being anti-Zionist, means being anti-imperialist, as Khaled was saying, mean means being uh, socialist, mean be, I mean, it means a lot of things, but it doesn't mean being anti-Semitic. I don't have anything against Jewish people. I actually not very religious. Uh, a lot of people in Venezuela don't even know what a Jew means, and they usually confuse Jews with Muslims because we in this part of the world don't understand too much uh, 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 those conflicts. Because the, I mean, we are living in I mean, too far from the from the, from, from the region, from the you know. So so, I, I'm just sharing that that particular experience that I, that we share uh, in in defending uh, the Venezuelan approach towards the Israel conflict uh, during Chavez time, and 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 dealing directly with you know those. Uh, Zionist forces in the U.S. and and, and that's what they do. They 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 they, uh, they bombarded people whenever they uh, they uh, they feel that something is threatening them. They immediately uh, rearrange their forces and and bombard people with uh, with media attacks, with letters, with uh, uh, I mean they have a whole toolbox of uh, you know tactics that they use in these cases and they reach levels uh, like the one that have suffered Khaled, for example, you know, uh, like with, with extreme uh, uh, personal attacks uh, as a human being, you know, being deported from, 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 from Canada, from Germany a few years ago, and now we threatened to be deported from Canada. That's like, that's the, the worst of the attacks. And also they do the same with academics, for example. 
uh, as, uh, uh, recently happened with one person in Canada. I don't remember the name of the professor, but it was, uh, you know, in the news uh, in recent weeks and we published several, uh, um, you know, uh, articles about that situation. Uh, our good friend from Canada, Arnold Agos, uh, uh, he, he pushed that campaign and, 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 and that's something important because that happened everywhere. And they don't do that on, not only with academics, they do that also with, with, with student movements in, 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 in universities, in, 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 I don't know, everywhere. So, so their strategy is very comprehensive. They have this big toolbox of you know, things to do in order to neutralize anything that sounds anti-Israel. And, and, and they do an amazing job. I don't know, I don't know why they did not do a better job and I'm right now thinking about the 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 anti-Jewish not the, the Mars Blumenthal uh, organization in the US that 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 allegedly chase a lot of Nazi Germans, but the US and Canada is black with those Germans and you don't understand who they really were, you know, hunting because, because the US is full of those Nazis and, and those are the ones ruling that country or has been ruling that country for, for decades. So anyway, I, I, I wanna um, stop about my experience in, in these issues, uh, but I also wanna mention the, the in connection to, to what I was saying before, the, the, the connection between the Palestinian cause and the Venezuelan cause. I mean, uh, by the connection between Venezuela and Palestine in terms of solidarity. And, and that's something that in my opinion, and I was sharing that with you before we went live, uh, uh, is the result of Hugo Chavez. Uh, before Hugo Chavez, uh, we were in Venezuela, all believers that, that that the by guys in the in the in the in the movie were the Palestinians. As Khaled was saying, I mean the 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 media and not only you know news and and and, and opinion and, and TV, but 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 Hollywood, uh, uh, radio, everything is a sign was a sign and is still designed to portray the Palestinians as the terrorists, as the bad guys. And when Khaled was talking about the, the, the hijack of pl airplanes, uh, it came to my mind the image of Carlos El Chacal, which, which is a Venezuelan that since the 60s or 70s, 60s, I believe, I joined the Palestinian cause. Uh, and they ha he has been demonized. He has been portrayed as, a, 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 as Khaled says, as a hijacker, a killer, a terrorist. Uh, but no one says that he had a cause and he's still uh, a fighting. I mean, he is in jail in France and there's a movement here in Venezuela trying to push uh, for his liberation because he was illegally detained in Sudan, if I remember well, uh, back in the late 80s or, or early 90s, I believe. Uh, so, 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 I mean, that gives you an idea of how connected Venezuela and Palestine are. And, and, but of course, uh, El Chac Carlos El Chacal uh, was like a, an exemption, uh, like, like a rarity among Venezuelans in the 60s or the 70s. But when Hugo Chavez came, he presented us the other side of the story and he let us know uh, that the Palestinians were victims in, in, this, in this story and that they have the right to uh, uh, defend themselves because that's basically what, uh, at least the way I see it, uh, uh, what Palestinians are doing. I mean, they are trying to defend themselves. They are trying to uh, defend their land, their culture that is trying to be raised by, by the Israelis. So I'm going to leave it up to there because I speak too much. So actually, that was important because, well, sometimes I, I'm not only media, but distance also obfuscates a lot of information. The Palestine and America are separated by a by an ocean, one of the largest in the world. So it it is common to be to be experiencing what people in these regions experienced and still do, and especially this uh, this thing about uh, confusing or confounding on purpose 
Jewish people with Israel and Zionism and everything while at the same time, let's remember that Palestinians have Semites also. Listen, and Saheli, you... sorry, sorry for interrupting you. I just want to mention that I didn't want to talk about the, 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 the Zionism in South America because I believe that it's going to be better to talk about that in the, in the last part. So, yes, so I'm going to save it for the can... third question. I understood. Okay, so yeah, so the fact that uh, Palestinians are Semites, this thing gets erased from the discourse. And here we come to the question of the international Palestinian solidarity movement. So even in the international Palestinian solidarity movement, just like every other sort of movement, there are internal divisions and contradictions. And uh, I mean, this, this is present everywhere, including in Palestine, but I will talk first address the issue of the international movement and the internal contradictions within that movement. And the question would be, could this split be seen as another symptom of the Oslo stage of the Palestinian struggle? So I would start with Dana. She will first give her opinion and then I will move over to Khalid. Dana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's important to first start by explaining exactly what this split is, and uh, that's what that's been happening. And um, it mainly is occurring with uh, BDS and the BNC. So BDS is the boycott, um, uh, oh, the boycott division and sanctions. Um, and sorry, boycott, divest, and sanctions. And um, the BNC is the BDS National Committee. Um, so there's been a growing uh, drama, you can call it, um, but um, basically any time um, a Palestinian person decides to pick up arms to, um, to, to defend their land and decides to pick up armed resistance, um, it has been met with a lot of demonization um, by the Zionist lobbies, um, but also coming from uh, like mainly the BNC. Um, and... Um, you know, just like a personal opinion is for me, it's it's a it's a crazy thing to do because how can you, um, especially you don't even like uh, like something that's, that's um exists outside of Palestine. How can you dictate how someone is to um struggle, especially when they're they're um struggling with their bodies in the front line? Um, so from that we've seen like uh B, the the BNC trying to separate themselves completely, um, from any organization or anyone uh, voicing support for this. Um, we can also see this hypocrisy with how, uh, like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, how they 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 they'll take a, a an issue a, or a, an instance of resistance, um, and they'll claim that it's, uh, it's 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 terrorism, it's horrible, and also it should be brought to the International Criminal Court, um, which is insane because for all the things that Israel has done, they they have not been held accountable to anything. Um, so what we can see, I guess, is a kind of like a a liberalization it's it's you know the same the same forces i guess that were behind the oslo agreement and uh, so for those who don't know um the oslo agreement i believe was signed around uh, 1993 and um, so the historical significance is that in 1948 is when um israel declared itself um independent and it's also the year of the nakba and um, which is um very present within the palestinian narrative um it's i don't remember the number but uh hundreds of thousands of people had to flee to their homes and many were killed, many villages were destroyed. Um, and basically this had to do with this, this part, this part that was occupied, we call um, historic Palestine or 1948 Palestine. And then later in the 1967 war is when they took the rest of the West Bank. So when we look at the, the discourse given by the, the BDS or BNC is it's always, um, we want to go back to the borders of 1967. Um, it doesn't recognize um, 48 of Palestine is occupied. Um, and, um, and this is problematic because it, uh, it, it basically erases the Nakba. It erases like the, the biggest, um, most horrific um, thing that has happened in the Palestinian history. And not, not, not the only thing out there, but the, the most significant one. Um, and it's erasing it. So um, basically what, what, what we can see is um, and also, I want to mention this uh, this report that I, I came across um, just earlier today. It's by the Jusid Collective. It's called A Tactic, Not a Trademark, How the BDS National Committee Supports the Liberal Zionist Agenda. Um, and it's basically explaining how um, the BDS movement has been co-opted 
um, to basically serve Zionist interests in a very subtle and, and clever way. Um, and this is um, like, if you're involved in the Palestinian um, like international solidarity movement, um, it's, a, it's a very like crazy and, 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 and like shocking thing to, um, to hear and to come to realize um, because it makes you feel like, you know, a lot of this international scene is, um, has very much been, uh, uh, what's the word, like in, invaded or um, uh, whatever by the Zionist lobby, again, coming back to the international Zionist lobby. And so I think, so basically this, this, this report does a good job of also looking at some of the like financial ties um, and, it, and, and it looks at other liberal um, organizations and calls them liberal Zionist organizations. And what they serve to do is basically to, um, to, to, to almost contain the like Palestinian resistance that's happening outside of Palestine, uh, to be a very liberal discourse that, um, that ultimately defends um, Israel as a state, it gives it legitimacy, and it strives for something that's impossible, which is equality for everyone within um, like the Zionist colony or within these power, power dynamics, which we know is impossible because apartheid is not, uh, is not the issue. It's just a symptom of the greater issue, which is the, the Zionist colony not wanting any Palestinians to exist at all. Um, and so, so yeah, so to, to try and make it short, so, so by boycott the Western sanctions is, is a tactic. Um, it's not a brand, it's not a trademark. And what we see is the BNC trying to turn it into something where it's like their own brand um, and, um, and, 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 telling, and bullying other people basically and telling them like what, what, is, uh, what, is, like, what is the Palestinian struggle. Um, if people go to outside of their line, they will accuse them of um, like being a disgrace to, to the Palestinian cause um, and, and, and that, kind of, um, that kind of actions. Um, so, so yeah, so this report, um, I just wanted to, to like read um, just the conclusions which I thought were really interesting. Um, and it says that the Palestinian liberation movement recognizes the danger of the BNC to the Palestinian people and their supporters and cautions the public from affiliation or collaboration because of the BNC's proximity to Israelis and Zionist funding bodies, role in reinforcing and Judaization, use of normalizing language as opposed to liberatory language, toxic and divisive organizing culture. It goes on to say that the time used by the BNC for performative actions, lofty yet shallow academic conferences and webinars has not, liberated, has not liberated a single inch of Palestinian land. The global solidarity movements have shouldered the burden of normalization from the Palestinian authority and from the NGO complex from which the BNC derives its legitimacy. Um, so I think as we can see, uh, all of these things are very connected. And I think um, that we're the fact that we're seeing the split. I, I see as the almost a positive thing because a lot of new things have come from it, um, and I think it really goes to show how the the struggle will will continue. I mean, even if you have these these people who have the money, who have the resources, and um, even them with with their with their salaried position, um, I've seen it firsthand, are not able and are not interested in in even mobilizing people anymore. It is it does all come down to performative acts. So I think the facts that these splits have occurred and the struggle continues and BDS realizes that they will not be the primary um, form of, of struggle, I think just speaks to the, the nature of the struggle and how it will continue. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Jana. That's, I mean, enjoyization, as you mentioned, it is actually a problem, not just for the Palestinian cause, it is, but I mean, it is a problem in, all sorts of movements across the world we have seen that how especially not just Zionist money as well as money from the US government or US bodies go into these NGOs which then shape the discourse to you know, like whatever their advantage is so in this question and along these lines just like you mentioned that the struggle will continue with or without BNC or there is a split etc so I will come to Khalid and ask him how can the Palestinian diaspora, as well as the general broader Arab diaspora everywhere in the world, contribute to this, the Palestinian cause, the cause of liberation, as well as to, like, to revive this uh, idea of national liberation, these questions of colonialism, and not just uh, like cover this, or, I mean, put it in a box of only human rights, apartheid, and human rights violations, etc. So, Khalid. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sahili, for this very important question. And I also want to say that I agree with what Dana said. I don't want to repeat what she said uh, on the uh, solidarity question, but I just want, I just have a quick comments on that. One is that we need to differentiate between what is a debate, which is a healthy thing to have a debate and to have discussions and divisions. Divisions is something else. Uh, the other thing is that we, I think it's important to look at the solidarity movement, not just as one coherent unit. It is a diverse movement. Uh, and so you will find groups who say we are in solidarity with the Palestinian people, and they talk about liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea, they talk about support of Palestinian uh, resistance, and these uh, uh, are positions that are always welcome by the Palestinian people and the Palestinian liberation movement. But sometimes you will find other groups who would say we are in solidarity with Palestinian people, but their demands is very similar to, you know, um, those who advocate for two states or very liberal discourse and what have you. And they consider themselves to be in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Now, we can't look at these trends and colors as if they are the same, because they also reflect two things. They reflect the Palestinian national movement itself, because they ally themselves with certain Palestinian trends. They didn't come from Mars. They associate themselves with Palestinian political trends. Also, they are local because they reflect the local politics where they are uh, active and where they are engaged in issues in their respective countries. So it is important to have a, a deep look into what is the solidarity movement uh, with Palestinian struggle. For example, the International Day of Solidarity with Palestinian People struggle used to be in May 15th of every year. Now it's November 29th of every year. The reason that it was before in May, May 15th, and the name of that was not just a Nakba, was the day of struggle. Up until 1975, 76, that was the name of May 15th, the International Solidarity Day with Palestinian people El uh, you know, rights and the day of struggle. November 29th was adopted by the United Nation on, no, on no, you know, to, to, to you know, it, it is the day where they adopted the resolution 181, which is dividing Palestine into, into two um, states, one a Jewish state and an Arab state. Most Palestinians will not accept that, but when the International Day of Solidarity with Palestinians comes, we need to participate in that and say this position and view this position. Uh, now, in terms of Palestinian diaspora, after 1948, every Palestinian liberation organization that you see has been established outside of Palestine, not inside Palestine. The Palestinian diaspora are the Palestinian people and refugees outside of Palestine who launched the Palestinian revolution in 1960s. If you look, for example, at the PFLP, Fatah, the DFLP, all of the Palestinian organizations were established in the Shetak outside of Palestine, including the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. So the movement in the diaspora was actually where the leadership is and where armed struggle in, uh, is and where the Palestinian um, you know, uh, institutions. So when we talk about research centers or the, you know, the councils of Palestinian women or councils of, you know, Palestinian uh, military commands. It was all outside Palestine after 1948, led by Palestinian refugees. Now, in the last 30 years, particularly after the Madrid Conference of 1991, 
and the signing of the Oslo Agreement, the entire uh, Palestinian institutions moved inside Palestine, particularly in Ramallah. What does that mean? It meant that the power and the decisions and the political decisions have been concentrated in the hands of the Palestinian capitalists and that the Palestinian refugees and popular classes have nothing anymore. Why? Because the Palestinian popular classes had the general unions, for example, general union of Palestinian students, very strong Palestinian organizations disappeared. The General Union of Palestinian Women, General Union of Palestinian Workers. So what the Oslo Agreement did, it stripped the popular classes and the Palestinian working classes and refugees from their power and give all the power to the Palestinian Authority and basically the Palestinian capitalists. This is how we understand the internal contradictions within the Palestinian situation because we are a society and people and we are formed of classes and social sectors just like everybody else. We are not special. We're just like the people of Venezuela and the people of the world. We have Palestinian collaborators and capitalists who are willing to sell their mothers in order to preserve their own interests. And the vast majority of our people today feels that their liberation project have been hijacked. So the immediate task for us as Palestinians, particularly in the diaspora, is to regain that voice, is to rebuild our institutions and our organizations by reactivate ourselves and unify our people in the Shatat. And that's why we are calling for the March for Liberation and Return in October 29th of this year in Europe and in Lebanon and elsewhere, because we want to send a message that the Palestinian people who are 60% of the Palestinian people are outside Palestine. These are Palestinian refugees who are going to continue their struggle for return and liberation. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, like in, in this regard, if you wish to talk about the Arab, does for also especially because you mentioned in the beginning that uh, many of the arab despotic countries or the arab colonial colonialists let us call them they are now normalizing ties with israel but of course them organizing sorry them normalizing their relations with israel does not really mean that the people of those countries are also normalizing right so like how uh, do you look at this at this thing, uh, assume something similar to this uh, capitalist class division, just like within the Palestinian society? Is that for me, Sahili? Yes, you're absolutely right. And uh, it's also important not to forget the position uh, that, you know, I mean, I'm talking about the physical position of the Palestinian people outside of Palestine. So, for example, how are we going to uh, draw our relationship with the world in a real way? Uh, this is a task for Palestinians outside Palestine. Our people in Gaza is under siege, as you know, and our people in the West Bank are under another form of siege. And when we look at the Palestinian people's situation outside Palestine, these are the people who are in direct contact with the Arab people, with the Arab masses, with the international movement, uh, our people outside Palestine can mobilize the international solidarity movement. That's why when we talk about, for example, boycott and the movement of boycott and isolation of Israel, the one who is doing that are Palestinians and their supporters outside Palestine. There's a committee in Ramallah who does nothing called BNC, and they speak on behalf of the boycott movement but they really are just a committee in Ramallah. They do nothing else except having a monopoly over the BDS movement. We need to differentiate between BDS movement and this committee in Ramallah who is you know, hijacking the, the decision and you know, manipulating the situation. And the article that Dana referred to is an important article to read because it's important 
to actually explain these uh, things in a in in a in a more uh, clear uh, way. And that does not mean that we are, you know, uh, showing our dirty laundry, as some people would say, you know, because in the absence of dialogue, uh, you know, where is the, you know, where's the laundry and the dirty laundry and the clean laundry? Nobody knows. We have to have a dialogue. And without dialogue, people reach into these kind of conclusions. And without debate, uh, there will be uh, divisions because debate is a healthy thing. What's not healthy is uh, division. Now, I agree completely with you, Sahili, on the Arab people and the masses of our region completely against normalization, including in Emirat, United Arab Emirat, including in Saudi Arabia, including in Bahrain. All of these countries who are these governments who are oppressing people and normalizing relationship with Israel, they are declaring an alliance with Israel, something Palestinians have been saying for decades, that these are forces that are in, 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 uh, in bed together, and uh, they're not in, you know, in any way, uh, 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 you know, uh, contradicting each other, but now the situation is public. It's not under the table anymore. They are announcing these kind of, you know, alliances publicly. But most of the um, studies and, uh, you know, um, polls have showed that the vast majority of people against these kind of normalization, which put us into a very important uh, question. How do we link the fight against normalization with the boycott movement and isolation of Israel, because in essence, they're one. So it's not just a Palestinian movement or an Arab movement, it's also an international uh, one. Okay, thank you, Khaled. Now, since we are talking about divisions and all sorts of things, we'll also come to the question of the Palestinian liberation movement in the present stage, especially I'd like to go to the international situation surrounding it. Just now, Biden had visited Israel and Palestine. Well, let's say Biden had visited Palestine and occupied Palestine, and he had met with the Palestinian Authority head, Muhammad Abbas. They do not recognize Hamas, and uh, I mean, they consider Hamas as a terrorist organization, just like they consider PFLP as a terrorist organization. Like everything that is not aligned with US interest and Zionist interest is considered a terrorist organization. So in this situation, I would first uh, come to Jesus, and ask him about the not only about the presence of Zionism in Latin America, but also like every country in Latin America, or at least just the most countries in Latin America, maintain relations with Palestine. Either they support that most of them support the two-state solution, some support the one-state one, or at least recognize only the Palestinian people as the ethnic people of this region. So how does this relation work between the governments of these countries, of the Latin American countries that recognize Palestine and maintain relation with them? Because they maintain the relation generally, at least in the diplomatic level, with the one that is recognized by the West or by the so-called international community. That's the Palestinian Authority one, which they originated out of the Oslo Accords, as, uh, as Khaled was saying, in order to some sort of suppress or hijack the Palestinian liberation movement, turn it into, like, turn it tamer. So please, uh, Sus, your opinion on this. Yes, yes, Sahili. Uh, uh, I want to talk about those things. But first, I want to I wanna mention something that came to my mind after listening to all of you. Uh, is and it's basically that um, connection between several concepts you know imperialism can let talk about that at the beginning racism which is something that all of us have uh, talked about capitalism and zionism i mean those are concepts that are uh, i mean interconnected i mean they they are interrelated 
and uh, I believe that it's important to highlight that because I mean, uh, because uh, uh, if we understand that Zionism is interrelated with capitalism, and uh, and if we at least we in the south and many people around the, the, the world uh, are fighting for socialism for a different position uh, uh, than capitalism we will we will understand what uh, Khaled just said about the about, about the about the the nature of even the nature of the you know internal differences uh, within the Palestinian causes and and it all take us back to to the struggle between capitalism which is the the dictatorship of the elite and socialism which is a dreaming which uh, a lot of people like us uh, believe that uh, the majority of the population are the ones that have to be ruling uh, their destinies and not uh, in the contrary. So, so I just wanted to mention that because I, I don't know, I, it came to my mind when, when I listened uh, Khaled talking about the, the internal, you know, issues uh, in Palestine and talking about the, the Zionist presence in, in the region. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, everyone knows that, but of course uh, we in, 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 in South America uh, have lived uh, that situation uh, uh, in, in, in a more dramatic way in Venezuela, for example. And, and I can tell you that, for example, in 2019, when the U.S. started launch this, you know, uh, failed uh, uh, regime change campaign uh, against President Maduro, uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, a plane full of Israeli commanders landed in Brazil. And that was news at that time, and, and it created a lot of tension. And, and I don't believe that that was coincidence. Uh, I really don't believe that that was coincidence. And we know that Col uh, Israeli uh, mercenaries are in Colombia for several uh, years, decades, maybe already. And uh, and and in terms of what uh, the Venezuelan reality, uh, we know that, that that have a connection with Zionism and with the uh, violence that uh, the U.S. with the help of Israel are trying to uh, promote in in Latin America. But thankfully, they have not been able to do it. But it's not because they haven't tried. I'm pretty. I mean, I'm pretty. I'm not pretty sure. I mean, there is evidence. Uh, uh, statements, confessions, documents that show that they, they, they were plans in 2019 to launch a military operation against Venezuela from several countries in the region, including Brazil and Colombia. They were the most active ones. Uh, and, and, and that connects perfectly with the presence of Israeli uh, forces in Brazil and, of course, with the training of uh, mercenaries in Colombia. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that with the help of uh, Israeli uh, commandos and mercenaries also. So that, that, that's just to mention you one tiny little example of our, you know, personal struggle with, uh, the, with Zionists in the region, but we also have the, 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 the Combiasa, the, 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 the Combiasa flight uh, from Tehran to, to Caracas. That's another big media operation that they launch uh, from time to time uh, against Venezuela because they say that the Iranians uh, are, are, are bringing terrorists uh, and, and they connect that also with, uh, I don't know, with, with, with Muslims. And, 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 and right now, for example, in Argentina, in Argentina, we have... Uh, uh, Boeing 747 grounded, I mean, kidnapped by the Argentinian authorities because they said that there were too many Iranian, uh, Iranian uh, crew members in the team. And they also say that among the crew members, there was uh, a commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard 
uh, which actually wa it was not true, was proven, it was not true that that particular commander died several years ago. But anyway, they keep pushing in the media uh, those lies. And when I, whenever I hear AMIA in Argentina, I immediately think about the US Federation in the US. I mean, that's a Zionist lobby that is behind all those smear campaigns against uh, Venezuela, against Iran, because Iran is, uh, is a, a close friend of the Palestinian cause. Uh, and, uh, and they try to do anything to, to, to subvert uh, whatever is connected to Iran. And, and, and that's something that is happening right now. I mean, we have that, the, the only plane of that new cargo company that Venezuela create uh, that belongs to the Venezuelan state and they have it grounded in, in Argentina with several judicial processes that ho doesn't have, that do not have any base, but they don't care. They just wanna make a big noise around something that doesn't have any uh, ex uh, real uh, explanation. I mean, they just want to smear Venezuela, smear Iran, smear the, the uh, and promote the interest of the of the Zionists. So, so that's what I mentioned in, uh, that to you because I smear Mossad uh, whenever I hear uh, AMIA and I smear uh, you with Federation and Zionist lobby whenever I hear AMIA and whenever I hear them talking about the the Venezuela and Ra Iran relations. So so that's another thing that 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 happened to us. And going back to the uh, to the to the relate, uh, I mean, not going back, but but in in relation to the to what we were talking before about what you were mentioning, Sahili. I mean, uh, the, the 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 connections between, uh, for example, President Maduro with the the Palestinian authorities. I know that there is a lot of debate. Uh, about those things, and some people um, might not understand pretty well why, uh, for example, President Maduro or President Chavez, uh, he also did that, uh, only have uh, uh, at least officially, visibly uh, connections with Palestinian authorities that we understand uh, are uh, heavily criticized by grassroots movements uh palestine palestinian movements so so i i i just want to tell you that uh, i mean those are diplomatic things that uh and, and you know uh sometimes when you are outside of the diplomatic uh, function of the state function you don't see it very clear because you analyze these things in terms of you as a person or at least you as a member of an organization but you don't see sometimes very clearly the 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 more complicated levels that are above you know that level which is basically the state trying to to have connections with other states so in that sense i understand pretty well what president maduro did president maduro have a a a, a, a deep relation with the palestinian authority with Ma, 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 Mahmoud Abbas, I believe that is his name, right? Uh, and, 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 and President Maduro also uh, uh, does that. And, and, and that doesn't mean that there are no other levels of connections. I mean, we, I mean, we for example, in my case, when I was uh, 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 in, in Chicago, we had a lot of Palestinian friends that are more connected to the grassroots uh, organization, and they let us know that things were not happening right. For example, and we have, but, but we have a, a strong level of cooperation between the two countries, especially after Chavez, of course. And uh, for example, we uh, received in Venezuela several uh, students of medicine from Palestine, and, and and sometimes friends of us told us that that those guys were friends of the Palestinian authority and they were not really, I mean, those students were not real, you know, Palestinian activists and, and, and we understood that and, and we passed that information to our superiors, you know, but, uh, but we have to, you know, maneuver between, you know, 
those complex reality that happen when you are dealing with with state, but also you are dealing with social movements. So that's uh, my explanation about uh, uh, this sometimes dichotomical, you know, relation or 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 the way people see that relation between uh, uh, the Venezuelan government and the Palestinian Authority. So uh, I believe that that, of course, uh, whenever when I talk about Argentinian and 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 Conviasan and Trasur, I I was thinking about the Zionist lobby there, and as Ahile mentioned, the, uh, the in Argentina, Paraguay, Chile, the Zionist lobby is humongous. The presence of Nazis is uh, incredibly high. Uh, 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 and and we have to be aware of that. Uh, and I believe that I'm going to leave it up to there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Leah. I uh, that is how I had uh, sort of envisioned it that it is sort of diplomatic relations, and in diplomatic relations you have to uh, maintain relations with the authorities that are in power or in administration at the moment and like not interfere in internal affairs. I mean, that is what the Venezuelan position has been in terms of foreign policy. And so I think that can be understandable. That's actually true for many countries in the region that uh, support the Palestinian movement or at least recognize the Palestinian state, which are many actually. Most countries in the region do recognize the Palestinian state in various levels but they do and uh, i mean if anyone is wondering about what amia is it's the it's israel argentina mutual friendship authority or something like that and it it considers all iranians not just palestinians but all iranians to be terrorists because it claims that in the 90s in 1994 1996 the uh, explosions that took place in the headquarters of amia were caused by iranians there is no proof they never gave any proof. They're not even that. Like, at that time, they just, to, I mean, it's the Israeli embassy in Argentina, which is actually very powerful. And it took control of the entire region and did not let the Argentine police, Argentine courts, or Argentine judiciary in general to operate and to find out the truth. So they never mm, like, presented any proof. They just say Iranians were the terrorists. It might be that they themselves were, or it was something like that, because not a single Israeli died in those attacks. It was all Argentines, Chileans, Bolivians, etc., who were there. So that's that's a very sad and still unsolved situation, I should say. And they use it just like they equate Zionism, like just like they equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. They also equate in Argentina, at least Iran, with terrorism. So that's the sort of situation you have, like this is the complicated situation. So I'll move from the West to the East to Asia and I'll come to Dana and ask her about the recent, um, I mean, all these sort of uh, recognitions and things that are going on, not related to the normalization with Israel, but related to Hamas. That is um, recently the Syrian government led by Assad and the Hamas authorities had a meeting they, they, and they normalized relations. Let's remember also that part of Syria is also occupied by the Zionist state. And I think recently a Hamas delegation went to Russia even, a country that does not recognize Palestine and does not recognize Hamas as an authority there. The Hamas went there also. So there is a, a sort of movement in this part of the world going on regarding the recognition of Hamas as an authority in Palestine, just like Hezbollah has been recognized as an authority in Lebanon by many countries. So I'd like to ask your opinion regarding this sort of uh, recognitions and reconciliations going on in the region. Uh, uh, we can hear you actually, please check your sound. Yes, Anna. No, no sound. I don't know what happened. Maybe it's your mic that got loosened. I think it got loosened. I think your microphone got loosened or something. Like, take it out and put it again. That works sometimes. Not in my case. You hear me now? <laughs> now, yes. now, now it works. Okay. Yes, you're back. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I was saying, I, I, I'd like to, to, before going to that, I'd like to mention um, or talk about what you had mentioned, Sahili, about um, Biden being in, in Palestine and Israel, and then he's, uh, he's in um, Saudi Arabia now. He hasn't left yet. Um, so, I mean, it was interesting. It's interesting to see, to say the least. Um, Biden, when he went into uh, Palestine, he was met with um, like a lot of banners that were put up by Beit Salem. Um, saying like, Mr. President, this is apartheid, um, which I think is, it's, it's funny. I mean, it goes back to this NGO, NGOization we were talking about. Um, and it's also funny, like just seeing people's reactions. And um, some people, like I saw some tweets like, oh, this is the NGO's like liberation um, strategy. And it's, it's that. Um, but yes, where's that other people? Like Mr. President, I didn't like that part, you know? But anyway, yeah. sorry for interrupting you. It's okay. Um, so yeah, some irony there. And then I, um, I, I randomly uh, just caught the uh, the press conference that Biden did with Mahmoud Abbas, um, and uh, like you know, obviously it's interesting the things that they say. They're trying to like like uh, like to win to win you over so that you're on their side or believe that there's 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 some sort of uh, a work taking place, um, even though we know that's not the case. Um, and it's just, it's just like funny, these two very old, um, almost senile men who, who really need to like step down. Like it, it's very questionable whether they're even fit to, to be, to hold the position that they hold. Um, and I feel like it's very just representative of like, okay, these, these, these men just need to just step aside, just let nature take its course to allow uh, something new to come forward. Um, and and in, the, in, in the press conference, and then I, I read some things, um, about this after, but uh, Biden's talking about how he wants to make it easier for people to cross um, through the Allenby crossing. And um, again, they're like putting more emphasis into this two state solution, which we know that Israel has has completely killed. I mean, it's it's virtually impossible. Um, oh, the, the other thing I found very funny uh, was uh, the discussion of uh, having PA agents at the border. Um, which I think is kind of cute. It, it, it almost gives you the resemblance of like a, a real um, a real state that has any power. Um, so yeah, so all these things, um, I mean, it's, um, you know, you can read it as, as, as uh, you know, um, as kind of like a, a, a something that's happening that shows us like this dwindling power also that, that, that um, the US is having. Um, and also, I've I've read other people analyze this, but that that this this tour is supposed to consolidate like this uh, axis that's supposed to be against Iran, um, and that being Israel and and Saudi Arabia, and um, even though like no other countries would 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 dare to step on that side, and then also going back to uh, Nasrallah's uh, speech, the, the the leader of Hezbollah um, the other day, and um, he was saying how he believes that this is a golden opportunity for Lebanon because there's been um, a lot of uh, contests over um, the Karish um, gas fields. And so it's um, like between, between them and Israel. And they believe that within, in, apparently within two months, um, Israel should at least be recognizing their, their rights to, to, to those resources. Um, so I think, um, and, and yeah, and also, sorry, as, also as you were saying, Sahili, about um, the, the news of Hamas and everything, um, and with Russia. And I feel like we kind of see these, these, these global forces kind of shifting um, to a certain like to a certain way that could be interpreted as positive, and um, I feel like it's hard to, you know, to talk about like like something like a regional reaction just because of how like scarred the Arab people are and just the like the wars that have happened, especially with Israel, um, and the perpetual state of war that it's been in. Um, but I also do know, on the other hand, that like the the resistance today is not what it was um, like in the seventies and eighties. So um, uh, one can only have hope that the that the powers move in the in the right directions, and and yeah, and that this is also a good um, sign from the that we see the normalizing between Hamas and Syria, and um, kind of really consolidating that that axis of resistance. Yeah, thank you again. Yes, I, I actually was, uh, um, I'd say, I had a great hope also, like because of the normalization between Syria and Hamas, because. Uh, like as just like Palestine, Syria is also a victim of Israel. So like Syria is a victim, Lebanon is a victim, like Iran is a victim, every country in the region is a victim of that state um, 
which is just a like a military arm of the US, let's say in the region. Okay, so I, I would finally come to Khaled and uh, since we're discussing all these contradictions and everything. So we by now we can understand that Palestinian authorities uh, collaborationist project with uh, Israel. And so could you explain like what is your idea of how can Palestinians living in the occupied territories, like the both the 1948 occupied territories as well as the present day ones, like the more later ones, can loosen this hold that the Palestinian Authority has over them in this two-state two solution, come out of this um, this situation, which is called the Oslo stage, and how can the international solidarity movement, just not the, in the Arab region, but also from Iran, as well as from the bigger powers like uh, Russia, because recently Russia, Hamas had a talk. So Russia or China or other countries can have an effect on this Palestinian struggle. Like how does Palestine fit into what we call an emerging multipolar world, which has been like whose emergence has been accelerated in these days. So Khaled, your opinion. Thank you so much, uh, Sahili. This is really uh, a very key question. Uh, I hope my mic is not making any noise anymore. Uh, um, we must remember that every time the, a people is subjected to colonization, especially settler colonialism, the very first thing that colonizers do is they establish a local authority of the people in that country in order to communicate their message to the public through this puppet government. So every people and nation who fought colonization understand this very well. We know that, for example, when they colonized India, even though it was not even a settler colonization, it was a colonization by the British. And when they occupied Palestine, the, the British, it was not a settler colonialism, it was military colonialism, but they established puppet governments in order to deal with them. The Palestinian Authority is nothing but a puppet government for the occupier. They act like a mediator between the people and the occupier. It's almost like local mayors uh, and a network of uh, what they call village leagues and city leagues. These people who establish these authorities are usually a capitalist or feudalist class who benefit from this relationship with the occupier. So there is a Palestinian billionaire in the West Bank who benefit from this relationship with the occupation because his companies gets all kinds of uh, special treatment by the occupier. Why would this Palestinian billionaire be against the Palestinian authority? This is an authority that represents a class just like Chavez for example, represented the popular classes of Venezuela and the interest of the people of Venezuela. You know, there is another Venezuelan example who would be a capitalist who would speak about freedom and democracy and all kind of stuff, but at the same time, he acts like a collaborator with the US to impose sanctions on the people of Venezuela or the people of Iran or the people of Cuba, because these millionaires, they do not care. Nothing will happen to them. For example, when they want to punish the Palestinian Authority, they cut the money because they know that the money is what's important for these, uh, you know, uh, class, for this class. And usually as Many like, you know, Franz Fanon wrote about this. Many revolutionary intellectuals wrote about this, that this authority between the colonizer and the indigenous people sometimes is pressured by both, by the popular classes from one side 
and by the colonizer who always demand more and more conditions upon them. So they always feel like they are the victims when they're not the victims. Um, it's also important to remember that there is a Palestinian responsibility here, and that is establishing the United Palestinian Front, our national Palestinian Front. It's not there, it's absent. So, for example, if Venezuela wants to deal with the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, who they can go to? The PA doesn't represent the Palestinians, that's fine, but does Hamas or the Palestinian resistance have a mandate by the Palestinian people as their official representatives? So it is the tasks of the resistance now in Palestine and outside Palestine and the task of all Palestinians who wants to liberate Palestine to establish the Palestinian United National Front to be the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Because we have two options. Either we rebuild the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, which is being hijacked by Mahmoud Abbas and his cronies, or we establish another United Palestinian National Front that fights for uh, uh, legitimacy by the people. Because where does, in a national liberation struggle, where do you get your legitimacy from? You get it from the resistance. It's either there is revolutionary uh, legitimacy or not. Uh, the, there is also elections. And Mahmoud Abbas has been hijacking the Palestinian uh, political decisions for many, many years. No one elected him. He's not elected. For example, uh, most Palestinian political parties agreed to go into elections in Palestine, and he just crossed it and said no elections. And so the last time Palestinians were had elections were 2006. Even though we're not with this election, as you know, like I don't support these elections. I think that no elections, political elections, should take a place under occupation. It should be, if we must have an election, it has to be a bridge to liberation, a bridge to sovereignty, self determination, not give the occupier a, you know, uh, a good image that Israel is so generous, it's allowing Palestinians to have elections. And that's what Israel wants to market. Also, it is important to see that this is not just a Palestinian story. Algerians, when they were fighting the French colonizers, they were also fighting this sector of Algerians called Herakiyin, who were associated very much with the French colonizers. We have many examples that we can give from India to Ireland, to South Africa, to Latin America, where people were fighting imperialism or colonization, and there were their brothers and sisters stabbing them in the back. Well, these are not brothers and sisters. These are a sector that benefits from this relationship with the colonizers. Now, what to do about this? If I am, for example, in uh, a political position in, in Venezuela, I would say, okay, we have to deal with the PLO because the PLO is the recognized international representative of the Palestinian people. But at the same time, it's important to have relationship with the Palestinian resistance. We want to have a relationship with Hamas, with the Palestinian revolutionary left, like the PFLP. We want to have relationship with these friends. And this does not contradict that. And I think that this position will be welcomed by the Palestinian people because at the end, it serves the interests of the Palestinian people. It gets, uh, you know, um, the mutual support that needs to happen, uh, you know, between uh, our two people. Now, there's another task that Palestinians had to do. Organizing our internal affairs as Palestinians. And this is important because sometimes 
things can happen, changes could happen worldwide. And if we are not ready and organized, these things will happen and we have no effects on it. And I'll give you an example. For example, Bolivia. Bolivia cut relationship with Israel. There is no Israeli embassy in, uh, in, in Bolivia. There is no Bolivian embassy in Palestine. And that's a great position. This is the highest position a country could take, cut relationship with Israel. But what does Palestinians are doing towards Bolivia? Do you see us opening, you know, like offices and, you know, institutions and, you know, building bridges with Bolivia? We're not doing that. So there is a self-criticism that we have to practice as Palestinians and not run away from this. This is important. There are the tasks of others, whether they are allies or friends, but there are also the responsibilities and the task of the Palestinians themselves. And we should not run away from this. We should confront our task and responsibilities and do our job. So if we don't like the Palestinian Authority, we should do something about it. We cannot just complain. And also if we don't like you know, some position that some country is taking, whether it's a friendly country or not, we should voice our uh, position in a friendly matter and engage in an internal transparent dialogue with our comrades uh, who might be actually thinking that they're doing something good uh, and out of good intentions and not out of, you know, uh, may, you know trying to take allies. And I'm sure Jesus have have suffered because of this uh, position that he sometimes he found himself in uh, in the past. Now, you know, for example, Cuba, uh, Cuba's under siege and uh, embargo for over uh, 60 years. And the Palestinians have always expressed their solidarity with the people of Cuba. But it's important that we uh, intensify our campaigns against embargo and sanctions against Cuba. And solidarity doesn't go one way, it goes both way. It's not love from one side, the love has to be mutual. And so it is important that we express that in a, in a very, uh, you know, um, a transparent and comradely uh, uh, way. That's what I can say. I don't want to elaborate more uh, than this, but I believe firmly that it's one struggle. Any victory that the people of Venezuela achieve or the people of the world achieve is a victory for Palestine. We know that this imperialist uh, power exists worldwide and they are uh, dominating worldwide. So anywhere you hit imperialism is good. Anywhere you strike imperialism, it's good. It's good for the people, it's good for our struggle. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for the comments, especially the talk about self-criticism because everyone has to engage in it. Now, since you're talking about uh, self-criticism, I'll just ask you something related to PLO and Palestinian Authority, as well as the Palestinian and leftist organizations like PFLP. So like the question would be like, how, I mean, no, we do not have to go into a lot of history, just sketch it briefly that how did this Palestinian authority become the only representative from the coming from the Palestinian Liberation Organization, what happened to the other forces? And uh, why is it that the leftist forces within Palestine, as well as uh, outside, I mean, leftist forces of Palestinians um, are not cannot play a more central role in the Palestinian struggle or a more visible role, let us say. And this question for Khalid. I think that this is also another important question. All of your questions is so uh, to the point. Uh, um, the Palestinian left is living a crisis. And this is not a secret especially the PFLP, because the PFLP is the main leftist organization and it's important organization. And it's important that we support uh, any efforts to bring 
the Palestinian left back to the scene and assist and help in every way we can. The PFLP have said that they are living a comprehensive crisis in 1992 in their fifth Congress. And that this crisis reaches the theoretical crisis, the political crisis, a financial crisis, military crisis, so it's comprehensive. It's not just one uh, side of the equation. And it's understood that after 1990, why 1992? It's because we witnessed the collapse of the Soviet Union. Arab regimes have participated in a conference where they recognized uh, that, you know, the two-state solution. Uh, the PLO have entered a crisis and the PFLP is part of the, P, the PLO. And that affected the Palestinian left tremendously. Now, in the last 30 years, there has been so many attempts to uh, solve this by confronting these challenges, but it is always, there's a, always challenges. One, the occupation policies against the left. We know that the PFLB is daily targeted by the occupiers. And they do this intentionally in order to make you always busy dealing with these targets, uh, with these campaigns, and not to look into the internal situation. And so not to let you kind of deal with your issues. They want you always to be busy. So Israel constantly attack the PFLP uh, cadres and members and students and organizations. The other thing is the PA. We know that, for example, that the general secretary of the PFLP, Ahmed Saadat, and his comrades have been kidnapped by the Palestinian Authority, placed in Jericho prison in 2001 until 2005, uh, and then Israel stormed the prison. And since then, they have been in Israeli prisons. So there is a collaboration between Israel and the PA to attack the PFLP and to have campaign against the uh, PFLP. The third issue is the PFLP leadership itself. They need to renew their thinking and to engage in real self-criticism about their situation. And I think the last Congress of the PFLP that was held a month ago uh, have dealt with some of these issues. Um, and uh, we are hoping that uh, the, the front will uh, regenerate its energy again in order to um, get itself uh, on the revolutionary track. The front needs to regain their relationship with national liberation movements around the world. They have to work on the international front. The front has a very special place amongst the Arab masses because of their struggle and their political and ideological roots. So the front enjoy a very massive respect by the Arab masses. The front needs to engage again in the Arab people's struggle. They cannot say, for example, oh, there is 60,000 political prisoners in Egypt. We shouldn't say anything about them. Oh, we cannot talk about you know, workers' strikes in uh, Morocco because this will get us in trouble with the Moroccan regime. Oh, we cannot mention anything about the Jordanian regime because the king might get upset. You're a revolutionary party, so you have to be in, engaged in all of these struggles and voice your opinion and your positions about these issues. The other thing is the Palestinian left is you cannot differentiate them today from the Palestinian right when it comes to women rights, for example, or youth rights. The woman has central role in the struggle, but you don't see that reflected in the left 
uh, policies and organizations, and that has to change. Amongst other issues, particularly, you know, it's sad to see that there is no struggle on the union front. You know, if you're a leftist party and you're defending working class, how come you don't have an arm that works on labor, like defending workers' rights? If you are a leftist party, a revolutionary leftist party, where is your arm uh, in terms of struggling with the, with the workers and with the peasants and with the impoverished classes? These are important questions and they deal directly with the program uh, that any revolutionary left has to, uh, to confront. And these are challenges and I think that I'm hopeful but at the same time, again, we go back to self-criticism. Without real revolutionary self-criticism, we will not uh, solve the crisis of the Palestinian left. If the PFLP was a, a very strong revolutionary party, I think most of leftist uh, government in Latin America will deal with the PFLP. Will 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 have a relationship with the front. Will enjoy this, uh, you know. Will call the and welcome the leadership of the front. But when you are not uh, visible in your uh, positions and your struggle internationally, no one is going to see you. So we cannot blame others because of our shortcomings. Thank you. Lots of problems that. Uh... Uh, an organization has to solve apart from being like being in a country that has been stolen from them so that's that's actually a very very difficult things to solve a part of it uh, only in part it reminds me of the struggle that uh, fsln had to face during the um, 90s during the neoliberal period but uh, they did not uh, face a country that had been stolen from them stolen by neoliberalism but not stolen physically also so that's something that they did not have to face but maybe there might be some lesson to learn there too how they refounded themselves so that's okay so i mean thanks a lot for that comprehensive breakdown of the palestinian left because it's difficult to understand actually even even among people who do support the palestinian cause okay now we have uh, two questions from friends who have been following in, in facebook and jesus has kindly put it here because i cannot <laughs> go into facebook i don't know why <laughs> anyway so uh, okay first there is a long question and it is both for dana and for khalid so i'd uh, let uh, like any one of you start and the other end and uh, it's from our friend Yuri. He says that how is it that despite many Jewish anti-Zionists speaking out and despite the growing solidarity for Palestine from all over the world, there is still an effective campaign to silence dissent on all things surrounding Israel and is still the issue of people ready to throw Palestine under the bus from uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who, despite his great CV on Palestine, workers' rights, and anti-imperialism, didn't, okay, he didn't call out like the, all the campaign that was slandering him, calling him anti-Semite, and also expelling Palestine supporters from his party. Okay, he does, and then, well, he mentions Bernie Sanders, who doesn't support BDS, and then the Green Party of Canada, who's okay, a former leader, I think it was uh, Dimitri Laskaris, who has a great, uh, I mean, you, you all know him. He has like a great support for Palestine, but even then Laskaris has not opted to run for the leadership of Green Party as it will reopen old wounds. So how is it that all these people, well, I don't consider Bernie Sanders to be a Palestine supporter, but anyway, apart from them, Jeremy Corbyn and Dimitri Laskaris are real supporters and there are people like them who, are, who aren't Palestinians in who are even Jewish and support Palestine. There are also Jewish in Israel who support Palestinian cause. So how is it that despite all these people, there is, it is still possible to call any Palestine supporter anti-Semite and just uh, destroy their political academic careers the way it's still being possible. So I think Dana can start it and then Khaled will answer. Yes, for sure. Um, I think this speaks to just how how strong the Zionist lobby is. I mean, you know, they're like 
their first instinct is always um, flat out deny everything. Um, and then it's to like twist twist the, the argument so that they become uh, the victims. Um, I think for me, the real question is how, how can there, it still exists so many like people, like my age especially or, or younger, um, who still believe in, in Israel and the Zionist project. Um, because we can look at the, the, the political side and, and obviously that can be um, very much influenced by material um, material goods and a material advantage. Um, but whereas um, I feel like the, I don't know, the everyday like modern um, young person, it, the, the information's out there, it's very accessible. Um, especially in the, in the last two years, the, the things that Israel has done has, has come out, um, you know, it, it's there, it's in media, even people who aren't interested in, in Israel or Palestine or, or, or politics or human rights issues in general um, have come across these things. Um, so yeah, I feel like it just talks to, to, to the strength and, and the hold that they, that they hold. Um, and uh, yeah, as for the specific um, political figures, I don't think I can comment too much on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, Bernie Sanders, I think um, we can find a few flaws um, within, within his discourses. Um, I, I wouldn't say he's anti-imperialist at all in any way. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I feel like a lot of it is just deflection and, and, and twisting things. And, and, and I feel like they're just gonna keep, you know, like kind of like how the US, like they're just gonna keep, keep pushing things until everything descends into madness. Like I don't see, like them looking for any middle ground or any like sustainable um like way to go about things. It seems like it's just denial, everything's just getting worse, worse, and worse. And then they're just gonna keep doing it until until they can. I think it's just madness really. Okay, no, Khaled, you can um, talk about it now. I, I think that it's really important to look at the uh, balance of power. Uh, in any uh, movement or uh, anywhere uh, it emerge, because that's what determines the discourse is the balance of power. So I'll give you an example. Uh, the movement in the United States, the Black Liberation Movement and the uh, civil rights movement, intellectuals, uh, um, leftists, they were engaged in a movement against South African apartheid. And they are the one who were struggling on a daily basis against the South African apartheid. But the one who harvested their work was the Democratic Party. Uh, and the United States looked like as if they were always against South African apartheid and they welcomed Nelson Mandela as if they were always supporting Nelson Mandela, let alone they left him in prison for many, many years and they didn't care about him. When the balance of power changed, the discourse changed and new forces emerged. And so we need to be very clear when we also talk about this to not to make it as if it's an individual choice. It's not an individual choice, it's not about Jeremy Corbyn, it's not about Bernie Sanders, or it's not about, you know, um, an individual. It's about the movement conditions and the balance of power and what kind of changes we, we see. Another example I can give you is that Bernie Sanders, when he, for example, was giving that message to the uh, youth in the US. It ran as a, you know, his message, they say that it found, uh, uh, you know, and hearing uh, ear from the youth in the US. Well, because the youth wanted to change the situation and the, 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 the youth, the students, they understand that, uh, you know, something is uh, rigged and rotten in the, in the system in the US. But I don't think Bernie Sanders is a genuine representative of that uh, movement, but others are, but those others will not find any support, will not be shown in any media, will not be welcome in any arena. They will be shut down and they will, 
not be uh, able to represent the movement because the system will not allow them to do that. Yes, they're willing to live with a discourse of Bernie Sanders, but they're not willing to live with a discourse of more radical leftist uh, voices. I also think that this allegation of anti-Semitic is very dangerous and dirty game that the Zionists play all the time in order to isolate one individual and kind of make it about that person. And that's easy to defeat. They, they'll defeat this person, they'll, they'll distort his message uh, or her message and they will win. So that's why it's important to understand that these campaigns has to be met with a, not with an apologistic discourse, but with a revolutionary discourse that, especially from our comrades, from the Jewish organizations who are involved in our struggle, you know, and they are the one who actually, uh, many of them are involved in this struggle uh, uh, and confront Zionism on a daily basis, trying to say, don't use our name and don't use the Jewish people uh, suffering in Europe or don't use any of our pain in order to justify your crimes against the Palestinian people. There is a responsibility of these Jewish organizations who are anti-Zionists to step up their discourse and to be involved more and more in order to, and not to make it, uh, you know, uh, an internal debate between Jewish organizations. This is not about Jewish organizations. This is about the struggle of people in, in general and, uh, and to, to actually be, uh, you know, uh, clear in our message that racism is racism. Uh, it's, you know, and pain and suffering of one people is not special uh, and more special than the suffering and the pain of other people. Our suffering and our pain and our rights and our human is common. So there is no like special status of one group of people when they suffer and others have kind of a, a less uh, degree uh, specialty on that. When there is a racism against the people, uh, uh, immigrants and refugees, uh, it, it is a, a fight worth, uh, you know, uh, worth fighting it. And when they call us an anti-Semitic, this is not, for example, finding any kind of uh, support uh, amongst the young generation today in places like Canada. Why the student movement in Canada are boycotting Israel, they understand that this allegations of criticizing Israel means an anti-Semite, uh, uh, it, it's, it's BS, it's, it's nobody listen to this anymore. And I think that the Zionists are losing in this front they're not winning at all. They can win with Bernie Sanders, even though he's Jewish, and they can win probably with uh, you know, Corbyn, but they cannot win with people, with movements. And it's not about a person or an individual, it's about the movement. That's why we see Canadian universities boycotting Israel left and right, from the Simon Fraser University to McGill to University of British Columbia, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, other, or other universities boycotting Israel, you, you know, in, in overwhelming votes by the student body. Some of the leadership of that movement in these universities are Jewish comrades. And that's why it's important that when we build this alliance for Palestine and against Israel, that we see, we see it as an international alliance. This is not only a task of one group or one uh, individual. And I think that this fight with this anti-Semitism, uh, also it's important that we recognize that racism exists against Jewish people in some places, in some areas by some trends. But who are these trends and political forces who are racist against the Jewish people. 
you will find in places like Germany that the Zionist movement are sleeping with them in the same bed. They are actually forming alliance with fascist groups who uh, you know, are really anti-Semite, like the real enemy of people and racist you know, trends. But Israel found an alliance with these, uh, with these forces. Uh, and so, so it's important to expose that uh, and not to, not to be intimidated uh, when uh, we are you know, charged with these kind of allegations because they, for example, in my case in Germany, they couldn't find one single word or sentence that they can charge me with as an anti-Semite person. They say, you talk about Palestinian rights, that's an anti-Semitic thing. You want Palestinian refugees to return to Palestine, that's anti-Semitic. Yeah, they have their own stupid definition of what, uh, what anti-Semitic is. And at the end, they deported me and they say, we don't like your policies, we don't like you, and that's why we're deporting you. In fact, they don't have any kind of case uh, against us and they are failing. And we, should, we shouldn't we should really pay too much attention to this anti-Semitic thing. We should talk about racism. We should talk about bigotry. We should talk, we should, we should confront these kind of uh, trends and these fascist trends, including the Zionist uh, racism. You know, the United Nations adopted a resolution equating Zionism with racism. And they, uh, you know, scrapped that resolution in 1991 because Israel said, if you want us to come to Madrid conference, you have to take that decision and scrap it from the United Nations. And they did. And that tells you that balance of power is actually what do these things and, and, and not how good you are with media and PR and how beautifully you can speak and how elegantly you can negotiate. It's not about that. It's about how much power you have. That's why today, for example, the resistance in Gaza, in, in Lebanon is very strong and it's strong enough to deter Israel. Israel occupied Gaza in one day in 67. Now they cannot enter 10 meters in Gaza because we have a strong resistance. And the same goes in Lebanon. And we should be proud of our resistance. And when they call it an anti-Semitic uh, movement, we should say that you are just a Zionist racist, you know, trying to uh, distort our story and, and, and move on. Yeah. The best thing to do, not to pay attention. <laughs> okay, yeah, of course. Like, I mean, they have power. They will continue to use smear campaigns. They have media. They have money. But at the end of the day, well, one can confront them, as you have done, as many people have done. So this, I, I think, this will bring us to our last question. This is from Elizabeth Ferrari, who is a part of the team, and she is also a big supporter of the Palestinian cause. So she especially ask this for Khalid, but I think this can be asked everyone, which is like, do you support the solution with one democratic state in Palestine? So that's a question that I think can be debated whole day or that can be answered in you know, one word. So I'll start with Khalid because she asked this question for Khalid and then I'll go over to Dana, go over to Jesus and I might uh, say a few things myself. Well, the movement for a one democratic state, um, it's not something new for Palestinians. Um, this has been something said and debated all along. And it comes back because of the failure of the two-state solution. The two-state solution is done. Now it's dead, thank God. And no one should talk about two-state solution because it means an apartheid as a solution. They are giving us apartheid as a solution. Not to mention that they don't want to have a Palestinian state to begin with, whether in 50% of Palestine or 
uh, 10% of Palestine. They don't want any kind of Palestinian sovereignty in Palestine. When we talk about the state, we take away the essence of the Palestinian people's struggle, and that is liberation. Because a state means institutions. What does state mean? You know, the question of the state, when anybody says a state, before it used to be like a magic word for Palestinians. The minute Palestinians used to hear the word Palestinian state, it's like magic, because they equate that in their mind to liberation, uh, freedom, sovereignty, these kinds of things. And, but when you look deep into the word state, it means you have to ask yourself state for who? Because at the end, a state represents the interest of certain people. A state defend the interest and the rights of certain people. So for example, do we want a state in Palestine? Is that what the Palestinian people struggle is about state? Well, let's take a look at our people in 1948 occupied territories. They are being considered Israeli citizens. They force the Israeli citizenship on them. They tell them you have the right to participate in elections of the Knesset and all of that. The question is, does our people in 1948 actually have rights or they are being treated with racism? They cannot even have basic, basic, uh, rights to build some time uh, 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 on their own land. Uh, they are not even recognized. Their national rights, their national identity is recognized. If you enter the Israeli Knesset, it would be, it's called the parliament of the Jewish people. If you're not Jewish, this parliament is not for you. So, I understand that some of the supporters of the one democratic state say, well, this is what we're proposing is not Israel. What we are proposing is something else. We want a democratic state that can see the rights of the Palestinian people and at the same time of all people in Palestine to live equally under one law under one uh, umbrella. Well, this is the result of the Palestinian liberation. Once the liberation is, uh, the task of the liberation is, is happened, uh, and the bridge to that is the right of return of Palestinian refugees, then what is the natural out outcome of that? It is a Palestinian, it is the society of secular and democratic society. We need to focus on the one democratic and secular society, not one state. It's not the state that we are after as Palestinians. This is what the Zionists want, they want a state. And this is sometimes what some other liberal Zionists discourse once a state and some good intention people also they feel that this is the way to go about it and they are genuine uh, they are really genuine about it they really believe that this is really the the solution of the conflict is to have one state in palestine and uh, to be a democratic state in palestine we think that this is if if that proposal comes from the ruling class of Israel, then you must know that Palestinian situation will be different than today. Our situation will be totally different than today. And then these kind of issues will be relevant to discuss and to have a, a discussion about it. But now, we would like those people who really campaigning for one democratic state to also campaign against the siege on Gaza, to support Palestinian political prisoners, to support Palestinian refugees to return to their homes, to expose Zionism, 
to be an integral part of the Palestinian National Liberation Movement and not just to be a bunch of intellectuals sitting somewhere talking about one democratic state when we don't see them when, you know, uh, uh, when we are struggling. The other thing is that I personally would invite Jewish young people to carry weapons with us, with the Palestinian, get involved with the Palestinian resistance, go to jail like Palestinians, fight, be part of the Palestinian resistance. And then that project would really be the project of liberation. And that would naturally lead to a form of a state or a society where people could live together under equal uh, rights uh, and be equal. But we, not, we must understand that Palestine belongs to the Palestinian people. And that land will never be called Israel for Palestinians. This is Palestine. And if they want to live under the sovereignty of the Palestinian people, we welcome them. And they are more than welcome. But it has to be the sovereignty of the Palestinian people and no other sovereignty, no other entity. It will not work. Palestinians, liberation doesn't mean political rights only. It means economic rights too. Who owns the resources and the wealth of Palestine is the Palestinian people. Israel is stealing our natural gas and oil and stealing everything in Palestine. This is the, these wealth, this wealth belongs to the Palestinian people. It's not about me as a Palestinian going to a parliament and vote. That's not what our people fight for. And so it's important to, to look at the essence of our struggle and not just of the, the frame or the content or the, uh, or the you know, just the, the surface. We have to look deeper into what Palestinian struggle is all about. It's also not about Palestine. It's about, it's more than Palestine. Israel is in our region in order to make sure that the people of the Arab world will never unite. We want to liberate Palestine in order to unify all of the Arab people in the region. It's not just about Palestine. Palestine is because of the Arab masses. And it's not just you know, a Palestinian guy or a Jewish guy sit down and negotiate and things will be OK. Then what's the problem with Syria? Why they're occupying the Golan Heights? And what is the issue with uh, you know, uh, Six, you know, uh, Lebanon. Uh, you know, Lebanon are engaged in a in struggle against Israel. Is that because of you know? Can we determine that as Palestinians because of the type and the nature of the state of Israel? And that what needs to be dismantled: the army, the political system, the economic system, the entire system that exists in Palestine need to be dismantled. And then we can find an alternative uh, system where everybody could live in Palestine, you know, in, in equal basis. But that has to be, again, under the sovereignty of the Palestinian people and no one else. Thank you. Tana, I'd ask your opinion. Um, I think Salim said it all. But, um... Uh, yeah, just going back to um, the borders. I mean, the borders were drawn by colonizers and um, it's been a great disservice to the Arab people to be so fragmented. Um, like everything is so close by and and it's it's impossible to get around. If, if you go into, if you try to visit Palestine, um, you're now an enemy to Lebanon and to Syria, you know? So also like those effects on a personal level, just like one or on an individual level. And um, for someone who has nothing to do with the politics, is um, it's uh, has a really serious effect. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess uh, what we're advocating for is a, a region um, free from imperialism and uh, violence and destruction, and uh, just uh, being able to uh, reunite the Arab nations and um, you know have some sort of healing or reparation. Yeah, correct. So, Jesus, would you like to add something? Not too much. I believe that that Khaled and Dana say it all. I mean, uh, and I guess I, uh, 
I'm a bystander. I'm, I, 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 I don't have the knowledge that that they have, and they say it perfectly. I mean, and 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 it's good to hear uh, these, you know, alternative voices because sometimes you uh, you got lost in, uh, for example, in Venezuela for many years, and still now a lot of people talk about the two-state solution. I mean, that was actually the the. the Uh, when Chavez started talking about uh, uh, about the Palestinian uh, situation in Israel, uh, he somehow inherited the state position of Venezuela that was since I don't know the 60s or the 70s uh, connected to the to the two state solution. But Chavez evolved and he uh, uh, as the concept evolved uh, as the reality about this you know proposal evolved and and, and Chavez I believe uh, uh, understood that 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 was not an option anymore at some point so 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 yes I, I mean uh, uh, in this uh, uh, in this uh, um, You know the complexities that Caleb just mentioned about the reality on the ground, the the different levels of you know of uh, of things of uh, subcultures embedded within the state uh, uh, make sometimes people get stuck into uh, the concepts and don't see the whole. Uh, picture or the whole uh, forest because you are just focused on 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 one tree so 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 i believe that that Khaled, what just Khaled just said uh, was amazing so so i'm happy to have the pleasure to listen what to what he said okay thanks a lot to all of you i'll just say that Well, personally, two-state solution to me was like very unjust. Like I consider two-state solution to be very unjust because just like you all said, it will then justify apartheid. It will justify settler colonialism. It will justify plain old imperial colonialism. It will justify so many wrongs that should not have happened and that have killed already millions of people around the world, not just in Palestine, not just in the Arab world, not just in Asia and North, North Africa, but everywhere. So but you also mentioned that right, the entire American continent, the indigenous peoples were genocided and their lands were stolen in the same way that uh, Israel continues to do it in Palestine today. Or we should also mention in the same region, there is another similar situation of colonialism that's a, related to Morocco and the Western Sahara or the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, which is also not like, It, it is not given its right to exist because Morocco acts as a vessel of European colonizers, just like Israel does in the region. So yes, like you all of you just mentioned, these causes, the Palestinian cause, as well as the Shaharan cause should be Arab cause, as well as a human cause and anti-imperialist cause. So that is actually, that is the position from which uh, I started pushing it in Orinoco Tribune. And I believe that we, we, of course, we will continue to do this and we'll continue to support the Palestinian cause uh, as long as it takes. So for the Palestinian liberation, we are here. Thank you, Khaled, very much for like, accepting the, not only accepting the invitation, but for being here like, for two hours, we have been a little more than two hours. So thanks for the time that you have given. And uh, for thanks a lot to everyone who commented, joined, watched this, or is going to watch later. Thanks a lot to everyone. Uh, I mean, please follow Khaled's excellent work. It's, uh, it's in many places actually. So in all sorts of places where you will find articles on Palestine, you will find his articles, so please follow him. Uh, Khaled, if you would like to talk about your uh, social media where people can find you, please do it so that our, our those who read us would also know you. I have no idea where they can go. They can go to many places, they can search. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, I have, uh, my articles are posted in, uh, you know, websites like masarbadil.org or samidun. 
you know, uh, for those who likes to read Arabic, most of my articles are in Al Akhbar news uh, daily paper in uh, in Lebanon and Al Adab uh, in, in in Beirut. But the internet is it has many uh, places where people could. Uh, you know, follow some of the, the articles in Arabic and English and other uh, languages, I think. But uh, I just want to thank you again for inviting me. And uh, it's an honor to be here. And uh, I feel home. Uh, I feel I can speak my mind with no reservations and no conditions. And it's a good feeling. Uh, and so, yes. Thanks again, uh, Sahili and Asus and Dana. You are always welcome, like any time. And we'll, we'll, try to, like, uh, we'll try to republish your articles whenever we see any, any anywhere. But of course, we'll look, generally look for English or we we'll might be translating uh, articles. So yeah, we'll try to do that. And also, like, uh, finally, I have to mention this those who follow Orinoco Tribune, like I know you would continue to read us, but also please support us financially because just like we say all the time, we are a 100% reader supported organization. Nobody gives us any money. So those who wish to support us, please go to our website. Um, there are three ways to support us. There is a tax deductible donation system as well as Patreon and PayPal. Whichever you choose, whatever amount you choose, whatever amount you can, every every cent counts, I'd say. So please uh, support Orinoco Tribune, read Orinoco Tribune, and also, like just like Khaled said, follow Khaled and follow the Palestinian cause. So thanks a lot. Uh, with this, I'd like thanking everyone. I'd like to end this here today. Good uh, afternoon, good evening, good night. So thanks a lot. Un abrazo. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Dana and Khaled. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.